afternoon to you all. Um, I'd like to start by, sorry, um, is this what I used to click? Yeah. Sorry. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the um, organizing committee um, as well as the Moscow State University staff. I'm just blown away at your professionalism and your hospitality. So thank you so much for facilitating such a wonderful um, event today. Um, I would also like to, of course, thank my legendary supervisors, uh, Mari and Nikolai. Um, thank you for your leadership guidance and your wonderful ideal levels of development. Um, to find your forms of development. <laughs> all right. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to appreciate all the work that's been done in the field by many of the people in this room, as it's only by standing on the shoulders of giants that um, I'm able to present to you today. So thank you. And this is Vygotsky supporting Iska, and then this is Iska supporting us. <laughs> Um, the overview for the presentation today is as follows, and I'm going to be presenting to you um, the first year research that I've done on my PhD. So I've just completed confirmation at the end of April, and I'm starting into my second year. So I'm mainly going to be focusing on my theoretical framework and my embryonic methodologies. Um, the proposed title for my study is Rethinking Assessments, creating a new tool using the zone of proximal development within a cultural historical framework. So let me introduce you to this topic. One of the status quos currently being discussed across educational forums is the assessment of children's development. With the many varying approaches, the status quo is in spotlight. Some of the discussions emerging from the literature include where is Vygotsky in assessment approaches? As his work in the problem of age clearly advised against classifying development based on symptoms. And are assessments reflective of the whole child where the National Research Council suggests that some teaching practices assess children on concepts that they have not had the opportunity to learn? And the rise of standardized testing, is it authentic? with the Northwest Evaluation Association deeming it concerning to assess children to static assessments. So what do developmental assessments look like in the field? Firstly, it depends on who's making the assessment. Child development is predominantly assessed by both health and educational entities, with differing positions and methods on how best to do so. In the state of Victoria, in Australia, the Maternal Child Health Service is the first point of contact for families, offering them official and standardised tests. An example of their testing practice is at two and a half. Children are asked to stack blocks as an indication of their cognitive development, showing their ability to follow instructions, demonstrate uh, fine motor skills and their hand-eye coordination. From a maturational perspective of development, this assesses children's stage of development, at a stage of development, being either competent or not competent at a task. Another example I like to give was at this same check, two and a half, the nurse asked the child to point to her heels, and she said, oh sorry, I'm not wearing my heels today, I'm wearing my ballet flats. And ballet flats are like pumps. Um, and because she, didn't, she couldn't answer where her heels were and the standardisation of testing, she was deemed as, you know, she didn't know her body parts. So that's <laughs> another example. This maturational approach to assessing children's development is sometimes used in education as well. An example of this is the Australian Early Years Developmental Index. In the first term of school, PrEP teachers are asked to evaluate children's skills across the five learning domains. Some examples of the social and emotional questions include rate children's ability to demonstrate self-control and rate their eagerness to play to with a new toy. The results are then converted into population measures, providing us with a snapshot of child development in Australia. 
meaning that this snapshot of child development is derived from PrEP teachers' evaluation of development from a Leichhardt scan. Luckily, in early childhood education, significant progress has been made. And thanks to Margaret Carr, we have a sociocultural assessment approach known as learning stories. Learning stories are the demonstrated assessment tool in the Australian National Curriculum, the Early Years Learning Framework. This is an excerpt taken, and the learning story is the story about the learning, and this excerpt is the analysis of learning. So in this analysis, it tells us that Donna is realizing that her text has meaning, and that she's developing literacy skills. But even so, in this sociocultural assessment approach, where is Vygotsky, and how is the social situation of development accounted for? This question, where is Vygotsky, is what frames the intent for my proposed study. Bringing me to my research aims being to develop a new assessment tool guided by the principles of the zone of proximal development, to illustrate how actual and potential levels of development can be identified in the tool, and to generate empirical data detailing how the tool works in the field. With my specific research questions being, what are the current pedagogical practices and theoretical underpinnings that are used in early childhood education services to formulate a learning story as an assessment of children's development? How can learning stories be redesigned to become a valid tool for measuring the ZPD? Firstly, by indicating the actual level of development, and secondly, by indicating potential levels of development. And thirdly, what might be the indicators in the new tool that show the actual and potential levels of the child development, of the child's development? How does the tool indicate two levels? So, theoretical frameworks and key concepts. So the zone of proximal development will be used as a key concept in the study used as both a theoretical tool in the form of a, of a concept and an experimental tool in collaboration with Vygotsky's genetic research methodology. But as far as concepts go, they don't work in isolation. They must be understood within their wider theoretical framework. So before I can explain how I will use the zone of proximal development, firstly I will explain how I understand development guided by Vygotsky's cultural historical perspective, as the ZPD is about development specifically. The zone of proximal development is a concept that sits within the theoretical framework of Vygotsky's general law of cultural development of higher mental functions. We've heard this law so many times today, so I'm not going to read it to you, <laughs> but basically my understanding is that uh, higher mental functions are social relations, but not every high mental function, it's only the social relations that are emotionally and mentally experienced through drama and perigivane. Um, I put the reference to Hamlet as because once Nikolai used the to be or not to be example of the, the two planes, and I love that example and it really resonated with me. But I won't be able to explain it as well as he did, so maybe you can ask him for a demonstration later. <laughs> Um, to represent, as a visual representation of Vygotsky's law, um, I found a little video clip that I think illustrates it really well, so I'm going to share it with you. This is on the, um, the TV, like it's developed by uh, traffic people to try and you know, promote safe driving. I was wondering if you were 
if any of our cultural historical people had been working with these guys. It's <laughs> pretty good. Um, awesome. So back to the to the theoretical framework. Sorry. I I, I embedded the, the video, but it, it didn't work for some reason. So, um, so back to the theoretical framework. Um, so, firstly, a part of the theory, the first ring on this theoretical framework is the social environment being the source and uh, not not a factor of development. So, if I ask you the question, uh, was the child born pre-programmed with this response? How how would you answer? Yet, yet, yet. Where did the child learn this reaction? From, from their environment. So um, obviously yeah, the environment is a source of all development for the child and it's the ideal forms that exist in the environment that interact with children's rudimentary nature. So that's represented as the, the tan colour ring on that theoretical framework model. Next we come to development as sociocultural genesis. And this is all about the process of how the social environment becomes part of the child's personal psychological functions. And I see that as the, uh, one of the factors that influence that puppet string. And that's represented as that green colour ring on that theoretical framework. Next we come to the lovely social situation of development that again we've talked about so much so I don't need to go into it. But Again, the system of relations between the child and their social reality. So um, I see that as that child, how he's learnt a new sign. And we can only imagine how his environment will change when he starts using that sign in front of other kids at school or something. Um, and that is represented as the, the, the blue ring. So the importance of the social situation of development in my study is that in the social situation of development, this is where the, this is the facilitator of the dramatic and the emotionally experienced events, um, which enables the zone of proximal development to occur. So finally, we arrive at the zone of proximal development. This is, um, as it was framed on the video, what kind of driver are you raising? A kind of rephrase to uh, what opportunities are you driving? Vygotsky defines the zone of proximal development as a distance between what the child can do alone and what he can do in collaboration with a more competent other. And this is what is crucial when assessing children's development, the process of how the child developed the higher mental function from the social relation. For the child to develop the higher mental function, the social relation must be emotionally and mentally experienced in the social situation of development. And this is where the zone of proximal development starts. It starts with what the child cannot do. And for those of you that have kids, and obviously we all work with children, that's the dramatic part. The child's pet dies, or the child starts at a new school, or the child loses a running race. Through the interaction of supporting the child's, the child, the child's potential is extended. But as to how far, that depends on the ideal forms of development that exist in the environment. It is in the ZPD created for the child that we can see two levels of development. How the higher mental function firstly appeared between people and then inversion into an individual plane. Now let me move on to my methodology. Uh, so I'm using Vygotsky's genetic research methodology and I'm still getting my head around it and it's so please just bear with me. So this methodology, the beauty of this methodology as it is it binds together theory and methods and they're cut from the same cloth. So I've used this diagram, but I, the client informed me that mechanical models aren't great, it needs to be more dialectic, so I understand. But this is just the start and it helps me understand that um, yeah, you can't have one without the other. So, um, so the, me the methodology has uh, theoretical tools and experimental tools. So my theoretical tool that I've explain is obviously the zone of proximal development and the experimental tool that I'll be using is the principle of interaction of ideal and real or present form of forms um, and that's then represented back in the, the methodology so theoretical tool being the blue and the, the green cog being the principles of ideal and real form um, 
study design. So how am I going to do this? So there's two stages um, for my research. So the first stage is developing the tool. So I'll be observing existing practices that are used in an early childhood centre. I'll team up with the leading teacher and we'll both co-observe the same child. So she'll observe her child for the week and do her usual assessment. Um, and I'll be observing the child with visual methodologies as discreetly as possible. After the observation period, I will then obtain a copy of the teacher's assessment from the focus child and I will then compare the teacher's assessment to the video footage. Then we'll move on to the co-researching stage where I will be doing, I'll uh, invite the teacher back for an interview and I'll ask questions around the theoretical perspectives and developmental knowledge that they used in their assessment approach. With the stage one and the co-researching, I will then develop this tool and I'll also have parallel projects, I'll be developing it as um, you know, an ongoing way, but I'll use those to inform any minor changes at the end. And then I'll go into stage two and that will be developing the tool. So I invite the teacher back and train the teacher in using the new tool, support the teacher to use it in practice, and then repeat stage one. So exactly the same stage one, but with the new tool. So that is the plan. In terms of my data analysis, um, again, just sticking to the, the analytical concepts and the theoretical tools, um, rough diagram, still working on, on how I'm going to do that. The significance of my study, um, I hope to pioneer assessment tool that focuses on children's potential to develop. Um, hopefully I can provide some empirical data on how the tool works in the field. I believe a more rigorous developmental assessment tool can lead to earlier identification of developmental vulnerabilities and, um, and lead to preventative practice. And also there's a huge opportunity to work with teachers in the field um, around, this, uh, around their understanding of learning process and development. So that's it for me. Um, please, if you have any questions or feedback, especially on methodologies.